So my message this morning is called Grace Upon Grace, and we're looking in particular at Titus 2, 11 to 14. So this particular passage, it's only short, but there is so much in there. Uh, one of the, the commentaries that I was, was looking at as I was preparing um, said it's one of those rich passages that has so much in there for us to unpack. So let's read through Titus 2, 11 to 14. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly possessions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us for all law, from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. There's so much in there. There's so much to sort of unpack. We could potentially spend a week on each verse there. So we'll just sort of go over it lightly this morning and just sort of unpack some of the main themes that are in there. So in verse 11, it says, for the grace of God appeared. So for the grace of God appeared. So what's Paul talking about when he says that, when he says for the grace of God appeared? There's, there's obviously that comes, when we hear that, what comes to mind immediately is the arrival of Jesus, that when Jesus arrived, grace arrived. But it's more than that. Paul writes in 2 Timothy 1 to 9, God who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace. So there's grace again, which he gave us in Jesus Christ before the ages began. That's so important. Before the ages began, which has now been manifested through the appearance of our saviour, Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality and light through the gospel. So this grace that Paul's referring to here, that it appeared, he's saying it's twofold. So it appeared in the form of Jesus. Through Jesus coming, it it became exposed to us. We could see it, it was relevant. But it was there beforehand, before the ages began, that grace already existed. It was already there. It was just waiting to be poured out. When you read through what Jesus teaches and what he preaches, he uses grace all through his parables. He doesn't very, very rarely, if ever, does he specifically actually say grace, but it's in all his parables. When he talks about the birds that are feeding themselves, God's grace to them allowed them to be fed. He came to show us the grace that already existed, the grace that had been there before ages began. Paul follows this up in Titus 3, 4 to 7. He says, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Saviour appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, his own grace, according to the grace that was already there, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. So there's Jesus again appearing. So that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. There's that talk of eternal life then. Grace brings us into a place where we can, become, we can have our inheritance and have eternal life. The saying is trustworthy and I want you to insist on these things so that those who believe in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These are excellent and profitable for people. So as we're reading Titus 11, just that first section, that first part, it's saying that grace is there, it's appeared. Jesus, through his arrival, made it evident to us, but it was something that was always there. It wasn't just something that happened because Jesus arrived. It was always there. It is something eternal. And because it is something eternal, when we get it, it helps brings us into that place where we become eternal beings as well. 
So if we go on to Titus 11b, and it says, bringing salvation for all people. So this is evidently salvation for all people. It's made available for all. We know this as we read through the Gospels and we read through all the epistles. We see that repeated time and time again, that salvation is for everyone. It's made available for all. The Great Commission tells us to go out and to save people and to disciple them so they can go and save people. So we know that this grace is made available for all. But Paul goes a little bit further here. He doesn't go to where you would think he might go to normally, which is he doesn't then go on and talk about justification. He doesn't talk about sanctification. He doesn't talk necessarily about forgiveness of sins. Instead, he looks at what we could call the ethical considerations of grace, what grace actually should be doing in us. And he explains it further and he says, uh, starting at verse 12, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age. So there's an action there. There's something that we should be doing. Waiting for our blessed hope the appearing of the glory of our God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. So waiting for our blessed hope. So we're waiting for Jesus to come back. He's referring to the second coming of Christ. He's saying that grace puts us in this place where it will train us as we're waiting for the blessed hope of Jesus Christ to return, who gave himself for us, to redeem us from all lawlessness and purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. So we see here Paul starting to talk about what actually happens when we live in this place of grace, when grace moves and takes hold in our lives. It trains us. It trains us while we're waiting for that blessed hope to return because he gave himself for us to redeem us, to make us his possessions so we could live in inheritance with him. And the grace stirs up into us a want to be zealous for good works. So Paul's starting to unpack a little bit more, not just necessarily about what grace does for the unbeliever who receives grace for the first time, but for us, the believers who live in grace, what will grace do for us? 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 4, Paul writes, First of all then, so first of all, then I urge that supplications, prayer, intercessions and thanksgiving be made for all people, that all people again. He's making it very clear that salvation is for all. For kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead peacefully a quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Saviour, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. He goes on in 1 Timothy 4, uh, 9 to 10. The saying is trustworthy and desiring of full acceptance, that for this end we toil and strive, because we set our hope on the living God, who is the saviour of all people, especially of those who believe. Sort of an interesting ending to that, that, um, that scripture there. So God uh, is, because we set our hope on a living God who is a saviour for all people. So God is a saviour for all people. But then it says, especially for those who believe. It's a twofold action of grace. Grace is poured out for all people to step into that unforgiveness, to step into that new creation life, to step into everything that God has for us. But he knows not everybody will because he gave us free will. He gave us free choice. So, But when we do step into that, we step into this extra portion of grace in a way of saying, an extra action of grace. So especially for those who believe, it becomes something different. It becomes not just a... a, freely given gift that brings us to a place where we can be in relationship with Christ, it starts to do something. It starts to be active in our life. Grace isn't just a one-off that we're given, we're forgiven, we're renewed, we're sanctified, and then grace's job is finished, and then it's other things that step in. Grace is something that we live in 
every single day. So what does this do? What does this second set of um, grace does? Paul tells us in, in Titus 1, he says that it trains us. Grace starts to train us. It starts to work in us. It gives us the ability to renounce ungodliness and worldful, world, worldly possessions and live self-controlled, upright and godly lives. It, it starts to create in us an ability to step away from the things of the world and to become more like Christ. It enables us to withstand the enemy, to stand firm and to keep moving forward because it has this action in us that trains us. How does it train us? Well, it trains us while we're waiting. So we're waiting for our blessed hope, Jesus Christ. So we're waiting for the second coming of Christ. We know he's coming. The Bible's made that clear. So as we wait, grace trains as we spend time in the Word, as we spend time in prayer, as we come around the communion table, as we spend time in fellowship with other Christians, these are all opportunities for us to train as we wait. And it's grace that brings us to a position to be able to do that, and it's grace that helps drive that forward. Because we know that he gave himself for us. He gave himself for us. Because he wanted to redeem us. It's personal. It's something that he wanted for each and every one of us individually. Grace was poured out for all people, but it was poured out for you. And there's a distinction there because I can make something available for everyone and I can put it there and I can walk away and people can come up and they can take what they want and some will get more, some will get less, some mightn't get any at all. Others might not want to come and take anything and that's fine. But when it is poured out for all, but it's made available to us as an individual, it means that the grace is there for us and there is enough there for us. So the first part that Paul's making, um, he's saying in this scripture is there is a universal grace that is extended by Christ. Christ extends this universal grace that is available for everyone freely and openly. But then there is a uniquely particular grace affecting of that grace for those who believe. So when we accept Jesus into our life and we ask him into our life, then grace starts to take a different role. It still does everything that it does for everybody else, but it, because we believe, it starts to move into a different place. So why combine this statement of salvation and grace with practical, ethical concerns? As I said before, why not just move on to justification and forgiveness of sins? Because all these things are valid. They're, they're what actually happens when we accept Jesus as grace. So why has Paul not gone down that route in this instance? Why has he sort of moved into this practical sense? So there's two answers to this. And first, we need to look at Paul's goal for the passage. So we need to understand why Paul's writing, because that helps explain his direction. And when we start verse 11, it says for. So for is like a joining word. It means that we need to look back. So if we look at Titus 1 and we go right back to the beginning, Titus 1, it says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of faith of God's elect. So he's talking to people that are saved, people that are already accepted Jesus into their life. And for the knowledge of truth, which accords to godliness. So he's, he's already looking at godliness. He's looking at the practical elements in the hope of eternal life. So he wants people to be focusing on eternal life, which God, uh, which God who never lies promised before ages began. We're looking back again, saying that grace has already been there. It's always been there. And to the proper time manifested in Jesus Christ and... In his word, through the preaching with which we, I have been entrusted by the command of God, our Saviour. So there's a focus already. He opens his letter with a focus on works of grace. So we know because of that, this is going to be Paul's focus. He's talking to people that are saved. He's wanting to, to share the word with people that are saved and to bring a new revelation to them. 
If we look back at Titus 2, 9 and 10, which is just before our passage here, it says, slaves are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that everything may adorn the doctrine of God our Saviour, the doctrine of God our Saviour, that doctrine of grace, that doctrine um, that has been explained so fully through the Gospels and in other letters that are written. Paul knows he doesn't need to go into specifics here because they already have that understanding. But the interesting word here is adorn. It isn't something that he just wants us to understand. It isn't just something that we need to be aware of. He says that we, we may adorn that doctrine. So when we adorn something, we take something of value and we place it on something. We adorn ourselves with jewels. We adorn ourselves with uh, nice clothing. That's what uh, Paul's saying here, that we need to adorn ourselves with this doctrine. It needs to become part of who we are. It needs to be fully over us. We need to understand its value. We need to understand its worth. Because salvation is beautiful, not because, not because God forgives our sins, but that he frees us from ungodliness and worldful passions and lawlessness. So salvation is not beautiful just because God forgives our sins. That, that, that is beautiful and that is great. But salvation's true power comes from the fact that it actually frees us from everything that's ungodliness. It frees us from worldly passions. It frees us from that state of lawlessness. That is the beauty of salvation. We can forgive people for things and if they don't turn away from that, if, they don't, if they're not able to stop doing whatever it is that, that we're giving them forgiveness for, we can keep forgiving and keep forgiving and keep forgiving, but there is no change. The beauty of salvation is that once grace enters in, those things start to fall away. They are taken away straight away. As soon as we're saved, we're new creations in Christ. We are like Christ straight away. But because we're human and because putting on grace is hard and keeping living in that state of grace is hard, God knew that we would need to keep refreshing. We'd need to keep reminding ourselves. We'd need to keep stepping back into that place and grace gives us the power to do that. He fills us with purity. He fills us with self-control. And he fills us with zeal for good works. These are the things that God does when we accept his salvation. Grace pours out on us. That is the adornment that Paul's talking about here. That is what he wants us to do. That is the power of grace in our lives. So Paul's burden was for us to adorn ourselves in the doctrine of God, of salvation and grace, to live in that place and to make it more beautiful by its practical effects. We are called to be ambassadors of Christ. How can we be ambassadors of Christ if although we're saved, we're not giving those outward demonstrations of what grace does? If we're still living in a fallen mindset in a fallen world mentality, then we're not going to have that beauty that this salvation and grace can give. We're not going to be showing that beauty to others. We're not going to be attractive to others. But when we do, when we accept that grace and we allow it to change us and train us and to move us into this place, we become beautiful to others. They get attracted to us. They want to know what we have. So that's the first reason that Paul um, was sort of put those together. So the second reason uh, that he had these passages with that statement of salvation and then the practical outworkings of grace is because it is literally the fulfilment of the new covenant. It's a fulfilment of the new covenant. Paul is making it clear that through grace, this salvation that's poured out for all, but especially for the believers, that it starts to do these things, which is exactly what God intended when he brought forth the new covenant. And we know this because we can look back into Jeremiah and, and some passages in the Old Testament that start to share God's intent here. So in Jeremiah 31, 33 to 34, he says, But this is the covenant that I will make 
with the house of Israel. So who's the house of Israel? We are now. We are God's chosen people. We stand in that place now. So when they're talking in the Old Testament about the fulfilment of prophecy for the house of Israel, we fit into that now. After these days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. I will make myself known to them. It won't be something that they need to read. It won't be something that they need to have someone else explain. It will be something that I will write on their hearts. They will know me. That's not to say we don't need to read our Bibles because how do we know God except through reading our Bible? But he's already implanted something on us so we can recognise him. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall one teach his neighbour and each his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity. And there's the forgiveness coming in. Paul knew he didn't need to write it because he's referring to this new covenant that's coming into place, that it is in place. And he's, he knows that people, when they read this, they'll understand that forgiveness is part of that. And I will remember their sin no more. I will remember their sin no more. That's such a shift from the Old Testament um, way of thinking and, and what God would do there because he doesn't actually say as part of the sacrificial system that their sins are forgotten. They're forgiven, but he never says they're forgotten. So there's two effects purchased complete forgiveness and purchased transformation. So grace gives us these two effects. It gives us this purchased complete forgiveness. Through Jesus' death and resurrection, there's a purchase of complete forgiveness, but there's also a purchase of transformation. God doesn't leave us where we were. He transforms us into something new. Ezekiel 36, 25 to 28 says, And I will sprinkle clean water on you, that you will be clean from all your uncleanliness. And from all your idols I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart. I will make you a new person, a new creation in Christ. And a new spirit. I will fill you with the Holy Spirit. And through his work in your life, he's going to bring transformation and power. I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone, that old man, that dead man, from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you. I will live in you. I will be with you. I won't be in the Holy of Holies. I won't be in a box that you're carrying around anymore. I will be with you, in you, and together with you. And cause you to walk in my statutes. Because you have me in you, you are not going to be able to help but to start to change, to start to walk in the way that I intend, to start to live the way that I intend. And be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I will give your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. You will be my people, and I will be your God. There's that personal relationship that Jesus wants and God wanted to enter in with us. He wants us to see him as our God. He wants us to know that we are his people. There is a relationship possession there. There is a relationship of love and kindness and grace and mercy there that God wants us to share in. He wants us to know that he thinks of us as special and unique. Paul, as he was writing, wanted to show that grace has been from the beginning and that it is available for all people. He wanted people to be clear that grace was available for everyone. It wasn't selective, it wasn't picky. And this was a problem that the early church had a little bit was they tended to fall back into whatever their background was. So if they were Jewish, they started to say things like you needed to be circumcised to be saved. If they were Gentile, they started to fall back into some of their, their different um, methods and works that they did there. So this was something that Paul was dealing with a fair bit. He wanted it to be clear that salvation was available for all. But that once it was accepted, it started a special and unique work in the believer, that it wasn't the end, that there was a continuation 
of that. That true acceptance of grace is transformative. True acceptance of grace is transformative. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And it is not of your own doing, it is a gift of God. Not a result of works, so that one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Grace has been poured out to us freely. It is a free gift. It is something there that we can take with both hands and seize and we are forgiven in that moment. We are transformed in that moment and our sins are forgiven and forgotten. But if we truly accept that grace and we truly start to live in that grace, then we start to change. The way we act and feel and our challenges shift and change We're brought into that place. It starts to train us to renounce all the ungodliness, all the worldliness, to live self-controlled and upright. These things start to take shape. And it doesn't matter what our background is. It doesn't matter where we were or who we were or what we were beforehand. This is grace just does this for everyone regardless. It's so amazing and powerful. When we're at Christmas... Um, the other day, we were sitting around um, the day before Christmas with Ree's family and they were talking about various things and where they were in life and, and that sort of got onto traumas that they'd, they'd suffered. And one of the comments made um, was, look at Ree, she suffered probably more trauma, and it was, it was her brother's talking, more trauma than you two have and she's normal was the words that we used or something like that. But the truth of the matter is, is regardless of anything that Rhea had been through and where she was and and what she was doing beforehand, at some point she made an acceptance of Christ in her life and grace entered her life. And that grace forgave her and renewed her. But then she accepted that grace fully and it started a transformative work. So the person that her family see, who aren't Christian, who don't understand this, who can't get their head around why it's like it is, and they look at Re, and they try and they fig- they try to figure out how she's in this position. And at times they've said, "Oh, it's because of because I've been there." And at times they've said it's because of different things that have happened. And they're always searching for that reason. But the reason it is is because of the grace of God in her life that has transformed her. It's because of that, and we've said that on a couple of occasions, and it, it just falls on deaf ears. But that's because people can't understand exactly how powerful grace is. Grace, when we accept it in, when we allow it to transform us, has such power that it makes us attractive to people. It has such power that it can turn us away from things that are so ingrained in who we are and what we are that they become like nothing and the new is put into place. So as we wait on our blessed hope, as we wait for the return of Jesus, as we wait for him to come back, we need to be training. We need to be living in that grace, training in that grace so we become more like Christ, placing us firmly in that new covenant that Jesus established with his death and resurrection.